Even when he's four days late, he's still on time. He's still on time. Give God thanks for special music this evening and our praise team and our musicians. They've made this week so special. I want to thank you for your sacrifice and being here night after night to bless us. And I want to thank everyone else who is here as well. Uh, that we have come together as God's people to study His Word. And those that are visiting, those that are here for the first time, we're so happy that you're here. I want you to know that the best is yet to come. I want you to know that the best is yet to come. I really believe that. I believe that God is saving the best for last and that He is building in these messages. He is building message upon message um, towards a climax where... All of us can make that full surrender to Him, and that each one of these messages is helping us to become what God wants us to be. Each one is a piece of the story, and as we continue to study and learn the story, we get the full picture, and we can be ready for when Jesus comes. This evening, we turn our attention to the fifth church, the fifth church in the message to the seven churches. We turn to church number five. And if you have your Bibles, you can take them out to Revelation chapter three. We began in Revelation chapter 2, verse 1, on Saturday evening. Saturday, Sunday, and Monday has brought us through Revelation chapter 2. Now we turn our attention to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. Now turn your attention to Revelation chapter 3, as we prepare to study God's Word this evening. Revelation chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. And to the angel... Of the church in Sardis, write, These things, says he, who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found your works perfect before God. Remember therefore how you have received and heard and hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief. And you will not know what hour I come upon you. You have a few names even in Sardis who have not defiled their garments. And they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments. And I will not blot out his name From the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, just raise your hand if you have at least one ear this evening. He who has an ear, I should see every hand. (coughs) He who has an ear, raise your hand if you have one ear. Raise your hand if you have two ears. Raise your hand if you have three ears. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says 
to the churches. Let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Last night, we, we studied church number three and church number four. And in our study of church number three and church number four, we came to discover the compromising church and the corrupt church. The compromising church and the corrupt church. Pergamos and Thyatira. Tonight we pick up with the fifth church, the fifth church. We pick up with the fifth church. And as we pick up with the fifth church here this evening, we turn our attention to the church at Sardis, the church at Sardis, as we continue our study of the seven churches. We saw last night, again, what is meant and then what is explained for us who are living in the 21st century. We saw that Ephesus represented the apostolic church and the apostolic era, beginning in the time of Christ until 100 A.D., we saw Smyrna representing the persecuted church. Great persecution came after the time of the apostles, and it had even begun during that time. For these numbers are really rough numbers that give an estimation, and I've even adjusted them a little bit, and they come in different estimations because there is no prophecy time in these two chapters. But based on what we study and based on what we know through history, Smyrna represents the persecuted church, Pergamum, the compromised, Pergamos, the compromised church, and Thyatira, the corrupted church, brings us through the dark ages to the study of our church this evening, Sardis, study of our church here this evening. Whenever you study the Bible, you're trying to accomplish two things. You're trying to understand what it meant at that particular time. And then you're trying to understand what it means. If you can accomplish those two things, you have done your job well as a Bible student. And really and truly, you can't do one without the other. You have to understand what it meant. You have to understand what it meant. And... In order to understand what it means, you have to look back and understand what it meant. Sometimes we spend our time proof texting, and proof texting is, is not bad, but sometimes it is flawed. What I mean by that is that sometimes you can take one line of scripture to prove a point, but a text without context is a pretext. And so we have to be careful not to do that too frequently. When we study the seven churches, we are understanding what it meant historically to those literal seven churches. What it meant prophetically during the different eras of Christianity. And we're understanding what it means. What it means. Because some of us are in Ephesus. Some of us are in Smyrna. Some of us are in Pergamos. Some of us may be in Thyatira. All of us may be in Sardis. And as we study each church, we learn something about our personal journey with Christ. Our personal journey with Christ. Tomorrow night, we look at the topic entitled, What's Love Got to Do With It? As we study the sixth church. As we study the sixth church. And tonight we look at the topic entitled, The Walking Dead. We look at the topic entitled, The Walking Dead. Let us pray. 
Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you that once again we are in this house of prayer. And Lord, I realize that it is not by might nor by power, but by thy spirit, says the Lord. And so, Lord, I pray for your Holy Spirit to come now to remove every distraction. I pray that you would cover me with the life of Christ. And grant, Lord, that as I speak, that your word will go forth and not return unto you void. For I know I can do nothing without you. Please lead us. Please guide us. Please save us, your church. For we ask it in Jesus' name, let everyone say, Amen. The Walking Dead. As the story goes, on the table before him, there were maps clearly defined, and the course was clearly charted. Lands conquered, lands to be conquered. And then, gazing across the sea at a vast land teeming with millions of people, he, Napoleon Bonaparte, opened his mouth and he said, China is a sleeping giant. Let her sleep, because if she awakes, she will shake the world. Napoleon knew better than to stir a peaceful sea and to wake a sleeping giant. The agenda of John, the Apostle John, on the island of Patmos was far different than the agenda of Napoleon. As he lifted his eyes towards Sardis, he saw the church in a lethargic state. Napoleon feared the sleeping giant would awake. John feared that the sleeping giant would remain sleeping. Sardis, the fifth church was asleep. In fact, according to Revelation, Sardis is more than asleep. Sardis is dead. That has to be the ultimate oxymoron. I mean, really and truly, those two words don't belong together. Dead church. Jumbo like jumbo shrimp and ill health and freezer burn and old news and pretty ugly. Those two words don't belong together. A dead church is the greatest of all contradictions. And it sounds like something that is impossible, but if you've been around for any period of time, you know that it's something that indeed, unfortunately, is very possible. Many churches are dead. Dead. Really dead. So dead, long time dead, dead off, dead up, dead down. I mean, I'm making up stuff here. Dead back, dead front, head is dead, heart is dead, legs are dead. Come on now, church is dead. Their sanctuary is a morgue with a steeple. The church has lost its vital sign. The members survive on life support. They are dying if they're not already dead. Many churches begin with a mission and become a movement, but then they end up a monument in a mortuary. This is a polite way of saying that many churches begin with life and energy and vitality but they end up dead, so dead, a lot dead, fully dead. I hear some amens, that means you're not dead. It helps the preacher too. Leonard Ravenhill captured the experience we see in places like England, Canada, United States of America, where life is good. We're living large. He said, at this grim hour, the world sleeps in the darkness, and the church sleeps in the light. As we study the message to the church of Sardis, 
we learn what we need to hear in this day and age, how to wake up and how to avoid becoming like the walking dead. The first lesson we learn is don't rest in the past. You see, Sardis, Sardis had a glorious past. It was a famous city. It was famous for once being a, pros a prosperous city. It was an economic powerhouse. It was famous for once being a beautiful city. It was a city on a hill. In fact, it was a fortified city. But eventually, they outgrew the city on the hill, and they had to have a city in the valley. And in fact, the word Sardis means two cities, plural cities because there was one up and there was one down. And the city on the hill was beautiful. It was beautiful. But by the first century AD, when the book of Revelation is written, it had changed dramatically. By the time John wrote Revelation, Sardis had existed for 700 years. 700 years. That's longer than the Canada we know today, and the United States of America. That's the United States of America at times about five. And by the time John wrote Revelation, Sardis was much different. It had been conquered a number of times. It was a declining city. It was a decaying city. And it's important to understand that what was happening in the city was also happening in the church. The church was not as nice as it once was. Revelation chapter 3 says that it had a name. It had a name. It had a reputation. They have a name, a big name, a popular name, but they're not living up to that name. They have a name among the people. But there's a difference between people's perception and God's perception. You see, people might think that we are spiritually alive by what they see us do, by how they see us act. But no matter what people see and no matter what people say, it is possible for us to be spiritually dead in the eyes of the Lord. We may look like we're walking with God like Enoch when in fact we are the walking dead. We may be on social media with our Bible, when in reality, we don't know where Genesis begins and where Revelation ends. What's also amazing, what's also amazing, is that Sardis is dead, and it thinks that it's alive. The church is dead, and they think they're alive. <laughs> Apparently, the church was resting in the name it once had and the victories it once won. It was resting in the blessings it once experienced. Their sense of accomplishment was so strong that they no longer sensed their need for prayer or their need for the power of the Holy Spirit because that's what happens when you rest on the victories in the past. Unlike Pergamos and Thyatira, their doctrine is sound, but their dependence upon God had greatly diminished. Sardis represents the era of the Reformation. People were living in darkness. They call it the Dark Ages. The Bible was chained to the pulpit. Unlike today, we have apps for our Bibles. We have different versions of the Bible. We have different copies of the Bible. We have all kinds of Bibles. But in those days, people didn't have access to the Bibles. Not even Martin Luther. He was a Catholic monk. He was a Catholic monk. He knew the teachings of the Catholic Church, but like most people, he never read the Bible fully for himself. Then one day, in a Catholic library, he found a portion, just a portion, of the book of Romans. And he read in that portion of the book of Romans that the just shall live by faith. And there was discovered in the dark ages a long lost truth that we are justified by faith. That by grace 
you have been saved through faith. And not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. Not of works, not of penance, not of indulgence, not of prayers that you pray because the priest told you to pray those prayers, but because of what Jesus has done for you. Because of Calvary, you have victory. And that was the discovery of Martin Luther. And so Martin Luther discovered these things, and he wrote the 95 Thesis, 95 Statements, and he marched up to the church in Wittenberg, and he nailed that 95 Thesis to the doors of that church. He made a statement, didn't have social media, but he was a rebel with the cause. He was beginning the protest. He was beginning the protest. He was beginning the Protestant Reformation. And the Protestants protested, and they broke away from Thyatira, and Sardis began her journey, prosperous and beautiful and victorious. But by the end of that era, the Protestants were no longer protesting. They only got so far. They were each comfortable in their own churches. The Lutherans were asleep in the Lutheran church. The Anglicans were asleep in the Anglican church. The Calvinists were asleep in the Reformed church. The followers of John and Charles Wesley were asleep in the Methodist church. And the people who began protesting got quiet, got comfortable, and they fell asleep, and they began to die. They had started strong, but their ending was not so strong. They were resting in the victories of yesterday, and you've got to be careful. Someone once said, you can't live on yesterday's victories and expect to be a winner today. Someone else said, yesterday's victories don't solve today's problems. You can't rest in the past. Yesterday is history. Tomorrow is a mystery, but this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice with life. I will rejoice with vigor. I will rejoice with vitality because the Lord has made it. Don't rest in the past, brethren. You might have a good track record. You might have a good history, but yesterday is gone, and God says that today is the day of salvation. Don't rest in the past and don't sleep in sin. You see, in order, in order, in order to get a good night's sleep, a good night's sleep, I'm not talking about sleeping in church, I'm saying a good night's sleep. We won't talk about that other one today. I'm going to try not to talk about it today. Testing, one, two, three, I'm not going to talk about it today. Anybody paying attention? Yes. See, in order to have a good night's sleep, you got to be comfortable, right? Need a pillow. Wicked every time. Yes. Need a nice blanket. Wicked every time. Maybe you need to crack the window, get a nice breeze. Wicked every time. Yes. You need some quiet neighbors. Wicked every time. But you got to be comfortable. I mean, some of us are good at sleeping. Come on now. Who's good at sleeping? Yes. Who's good at, good at sleeping? Yes. I'm so good at sleeping, I can fall asleep without even thinking about it. I'm good. So good. Excellent. Some of you struggle. I know you struggle. I know you struggle. But listen, I can fall asleep. I was so, I was so... I was so tired and exhausted and sick on Mount Sinai. I was on Mount Sinai of all places. The Bedouins took us up for sunset. We had devotion, and we were getting ready to come back. The only problem is I had drank some of the water by accident the day before. My stomach, it was like the great controversy was happening in my stomach. Christ against Satan down in my belly. And it was not so nice. There were some problems, and the problems were happening in the worst place of all, on Mount Sinai. 
And so they don't have like plumbing on Mount Sinai, but they have these little outhouses on Mount Sinai. So I had to go to this little place on Mount Sinai. And as I was in the little place in Mount Sinai, can you imagine the rest of the group from Andrews University, they kept on going. And it was nighttime. And I had some LED flashlight. You know, LED doesn't work good. You need like a torch, right? And we had this dim lights. I'm on Mount Sinai. And my class is gone. And the Bedouins are gone. I'm in Egypt. On a mountain. Run my belly. Struggling. And I knew that I had to move with speed. Speed of the three angels. If I was going to catch up with the crew, but I'm telling you, I was so tired. I was so tired. I could see their little LEDs in the distance. I had to move with speed. But I was so tired that at one point, I had visions of just laying down on the ground and going to sleep. And I just figured whatever is going to happen is going to happen. And if I wake up, I'll wake up, and then I'll find my way to the bottom of the mountain when it's daylight. And me, I'm the type of guy, the way I sleep, I could lay down on that floor, that ground, I could find a rock for a pillow, and I would fall asleep. But you know, to really get a good night's sleep, to really get a good night's sleep, you gotta be comfortable. You gotta be comfortable. Sometimes, sometimes, I like to run a hot bath. Put in some soap, some bubbles, some Epsom salts. Yes. Yes. I just sit in that thing and play some gospel music. Just relax. Sometimes you fall asleep right in the tub. But then when you hit the bed, you're gone. Gone. Comfortable. See, when you're really comfortable, you can fall asleep. And once you fall asleep, and once you're comfortable, you can lose consciousness. It's the same with sin. When you get too comfortable with sin, right? Like when you, when you stay in that place and get comfortable and get adjusted, and get used to it. When you customize that thing and get close to that thing and cuddle up to that thing, when you get comfortable with sin, you lose spiritual consciousness. You're like Samson. He was strong, but he had a weakness. Her name was Delilah. Judges 16 and verse 19 says, having put him to sleep, Lord Jesus, Having put the man to sleep on her lap, she called the next man to shave off the seven braids of his hair and so began to subdue him and his strength left him. Sin will put you to sleep. Sin will rob you of your God-given strength. Sin will kill you. For in the end, Samson dies. Proverbs 14 and verse 12 says, There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Though we experience some redemption, the end of Samson was worse than the beginning. He died as a blind, broken, and buried man, buried under the rubble of stone. Like Samson, we fall asleep. We get comfortable in the lap of comfort. Maybe it's not Delilah. Come on now. Maybe it's not Delilah. Maybe it's not a woman. Maybe it's a man. Maybe it's not a person. Maybe it's a place. Maybe it's a practice. Maybe it's a fantasy. Maybe it's something that's become a part of you. And sometimes we get to the point like Sardis where we don't even see our own condition. 
because we're riding the wave of the past. And, and, and everybody thinks that we're doing well. You know, sometimes we're up here singing and preaching and doing the work of the Lord, but we don't know the Lord of the work. And like Samson, we fall asleep in the lap of comfort and believe that one day we can just get up and keep on fighting. But you can't fall asleep in the lap of Delilah and get up to wield the sword of the Lord. You'll only slip away from Delilah a few times. But finally, she'll catch you. And that's the nature of sin. You can slip away a few times. You can play with fire a few times. But eventually, you're going to get burned. Don't fall asleep in sin. When we look at the seven churches, we see a progression. We see a picture that is painted. Ephesus left its first love, drifted away from God, drifting. And while it was drifting, then came Smyrna, hardship, difficulty. And if there wasn't already distance between God's people and God, the hardship came. And listen, there is, there is, it is difficult to have a good time when there's hardship, when there's no money, right? They say more money makes more problems, but no money makes problems too. Yeah, yeah, they need to remix that song. Because I've lived that life. Have you been there? Can't pay your bills. Have you been there? Creditor calling. Have you been there? Hard times. Yes. Come on now. Distance as, as Ephesus drifts. Distance as there's hardship. And then Pergamos flirting with sin. The Nicolaitans and the Balaamites tolerating this false teaching. And then falling in sin. Jezebel comes and takes over the pulpit. And then dying in sin. And then dying in sin. And then dying in sin. They say someone, you know, with a terminal disease, I've seen it as a pastor. All of a sudden, there's a resurgence. There's a resurgence. You think God has worked a miracle and this person is healed. But it's just, it's just a little blip on the radar. And soon enough, the person flatlines. It's almost what we see with Sardis. Little resurgence of life, but then total flatline. It's interesting. You study the book of Revelation, and you look at the different churches. Some receive commendation. Some receive condemnation. Some receive both. Sardis receives no commendation. No commendation. Thyatira. Jezebel Church got some commendation. Sardis? Sardis gets no commendation. Can you believe it? And when you look at Sardis, it's interesting because Sardis has no doctrinal problems. They are actually like doctrin doctrinally sound. There's no Balaamites. There's no Nicolaitans. There's no Jezebel. There's no mention of opposition or persecution like Smyrna. Instead, there is a reputation without reality. There is form without force. And Paul talked about it, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. They are asleep in a former splendor. They are dead in their transgressions. Oh, my brothers and sisters, don't fall asleep in sin. Don't get comfortable in the church. Don't get comfortable in the church because you might end up worse than Thyatira. Don't rest in sin. Don't, don't rest in the past. Don't sleep in sin. And then be faithful to God's word. The fifth church gets five things as a recommendation for change. Fifth church, five things. Be watchful. Watch, it says. Strengthen what remains so that it doesn't die. What does that mean? Well, listen. Not every church is firing on all cylinders. Yeah. Some of us are firing on three. Some of us two. Some of us one. But don't lose that one cylinder. 
Come on now. Don't lose the ministry that works. Right? What do you have here? The Haven Cafe. Wish they had it at my church. Wish they had it at my church. My church has music. My church is known as a musical church. Right? Gifted musically. People come to our church when they want to have some praise and worship. But we don't have the Haven Cafe. Right? You have the Haven Cafe. Don't lose the Haven Cafe. Don't let the Haven Cafe die. You may not have energy for praise and worship. You may not have energy for for preaching. You may not have energy to do what some other churches are doing. But what you have, strengthen what you have. Get behind what you have. Make it the best cafe in all of London. Make it the best cafe in all of the UK. Make it a mission spotlight that people watch on Sabbath mornings. You got to watch. You got to strengthen what remains. You got to remember what you've heard. Remember what is being said in the message from God. You have to hold fast. And then, as we say over and over again in these messages, you have to repent. It shows up over and over again. You got to make a change. You can't expect different results doing things the exact same. So, God gives a five step formula. For the dead church to come to life. If you do those five things, watch, strengthen what remains, remember what you've heard, hold fast and repent, you will experience life. Because you see, that's what happens when you follow God's word. I remember when I walked into the Seventh-day Adventist church. Walked in, I'm going to talk about it tomorrow. Walked into the church, I looked Nothing like a Christian. I look nothing like a seven-day Adventist. But I walked into that church, walked into that church, heard this evangelist singing a song. He used to march in, this big man. Came in every night with a big robe, and he sang this song every night. He said, things are getting better. (laughs) Things are getting better. For the Lord is on my side. Things are getting better, getting better for me. Things are getting better. Things are getting better. (laughs) Things are getting better. For the Lord is on my side. Things are getting better gets him better for me one more time because we got a pianist now things are getting better things are getting better for the lord is on my side things are getting better getting better for me Things are getting better. Listen, I came in, I heard that song every night. And that's the message I needed to hear because I was dead. Dead in my sins. Dead in my drug addiction. Dead in my family's problems. My family history. Dead, dead in my low self-esteem. Dead in my low self-image. My grades were dead in high school. My pocket was dead. No money. Everything dead. But when I came in and heard that song, I heard a message of hope. And when I sat down in the pew and the preacher preached, the Word of God did something. Word of God did something. That's why you can't remove the preaching of God's Word. Yes, we need some new methods to communicate the message But you cannot remove the method of preaching the gospel. There is something that happens when we hear the word of God. The word of God got through the drug addiction and got through the secular music and got through the bad experiences. And there I was in the church. And after three sermons, I made my decision to come back to life. That's what happens when we hear the word of God. John 6 and verse 63 says, It is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you, they are spirits and they are life. God is in the business 
of bringing dead things back to life. Yeah, maybe you got some dead finances. Maybe you got some dead relationships. Maybe you're dead in your sins, but God has a way of bringing those things back to life. See, God's not afraid of dead things. Some of us were afraid. We don't like duppy. <laughs> don't like the duppy. No duppy. No, dead. Fully dead. Yeah, when I was young, I didn't know what duppy was, but I knew what a ghost was. I learned duppy when I came in the church. Someone asked me today, how do you know all these things? I said, I've been in the church more than half my life. I was born Canadian, but all of a sudden seemed to be a little West Indian. <laughs> yeah, I didn't grow up knowing what duppy was, but I knew what ghost was. I knew what ghost was, and I was afraid of walking through the cemetery. Yeah, so when I went to my one friend's house, my one friend's house, I used to take the long way. I used to take the long way. There was a shortcut through the cemetery, but I'm not going through the cemetery. I don't like dead things. We see God's not afraid of dead things. <laughs> some, people, some people crash weddings. Jesus crashed funerals. Resurrected a dead boy. Resurrected the daughter, the, the daughter of Jairus. Resurrected the brother of Mary and Martha. His name was Lazarus. God's not afraid of dead things. God even talks to dead things. He can handle a dead church, but the dead church must listen to what he says, just like Lazarus, just like Lazarus. Jesus said, roll away the stone. And the sisters said, Lord, by this time, there's a bad odor, for he's been dead for four days. And the Jews believed that the soul of an individual hovered over the body for three days, hoping for resuscitation to take place. But after the third day, there was no hope for resurrection. And so Jesus was late on purpose. Yeah, even Jesus was late, Sister Cuffy. Sometimes God is late. Yes, don't use that as an excuse, though. That's a little freebie, but only pastors are allowed to use that. Sometimes God is late, but it's because there's a bigger plan, and there's a bigger picture. Sometimes God is late because there's a piece of the story that you don't know, and you can't see. And so even when he's four days late, he's still on time. Yeah. Praise God. He'll show up at the right time. He may not come when you want him to, but thank God he'll still come on time. Day one, they had all hope. Day two, they had some hope. Day three, they had a little hope. But now, all they have is a dead, smelly, stinky, decomposing body. Lazarus stinks. That's how it is. Sometimes life stinks. But God can stop the stink. Would you say amen? amen? Lazarus is buried, and that's what people do when they decide you're not coming back. The moment they realize you won't be coming back, they unhook the life support. They stop answering your phone calls. They stop responding to your text messages. They put you where they can't see you, buried in a coffin, in a tomb. Pack him away, put him away, bury him. He's not getting up. He's not getting out. He'll never buy a house. He'll never hold a job. He'll never be a father. He'll never beat the addiction. They bury you and decide you won't be back. It's four days. It's over. It's finished. That's it. But then Jesus says, roll away the stone. And then he spoke three words. He said, Lazarus, come forth. Notice he didn't say, Lazarus, come down from heaven, or Lazarus, come up from hell. He said, Lazarus, come forth from the grave. And by the way, that's God's call on your life. Come forth. Come forth. Come out of the sin. Come out of her, my people. Get up. Get out. Get on your feet. And that's exactly what happened. Dead man was walking. Lazarus was wrapped up, but the word of God made a difference. The word became flesh and dwelt inside of him. 
The Word of God will change you. The Word of God will save you. That's why we have to come to church. That's why we have to hear the sermon. Because the Word will bring you back to life. People are dying because they haven't heard the word. Don't kill the mic on me, please. Addicted because they haven't heard the word. Dying and dead because they haven't heard the word. Lazarus, come forth, said Jesus. And someone said, it's a good thing he used the proper noun, Lazarus, because if he had simply said, come forth, he's got so much power. That everyone would have come forth that way, that day, all the way from righteous Abel up to the saints that died that morning. He said, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus came forth. Dead men don't do that. Dead men don't come out. Dead men don't wake up. There's a lot of dead men in the 21st century. Would you say amen? They call them dead men. Sometimes you call them waste men. Dead hearts don't beat. Dried blood doesn't rush. Empty lungs don't inhale. Dead men don't come out unless they hear the voice of Jesus Christ. The ears of the dead may be deaf to your voice. They may be deaf to my voice, but they're not deaf to the voice of Jesus. For Jesus said, my words are spirit. My words are life. And when Christ speaks to the dead, the dead listen. And one day he's going to say the same thing. Did you know that? One day he's going to say those same words come forth. For Jesus said, do not marvel at this. For the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will come forth. Will hear his voice and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life. And those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. The Bible tells us that one day Christ will say, come forth, and husbands will be reunited with wives. Parents will be reunited with children. Mothers will be reunited with those miscarried child. Brothers will be reunited with sisters. One day Jesus will say, come forth, And if we live by his word now, we will hear his word on that day. So be faithful to the word of God. And last but certainly not least, be ready. Be ready for God's coming. For Jesus said, be ready. For the Son of Man comes at an hour that you do not think. Thank you, sister. And the same message came to the church at Sardis. Same message, same Jesus, same word of God. Said, therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. Peter said the same thing. He said, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. And some people listen to that and they say, well, there you have the support for what we call the secret rapture. It's a popular teaching. People believe that Jesus is going to come secretly, quietly. And then his people will secretly, quietly vanish. One will be taken and another will be left. And that's what the Bible says. But all that it's saying is that the righteous will go up and the unrighteous will stay down. But it's not saying that Jesus is coming quietly. Some people believe that we'll be on the bus one day and all of a sudden the people we walked on the bus with will be gone. And the rest of us will be left behind. Pastor Goddard and I will be driving one day And the righteous pastor will be taken. And the other pastor will be left behind. That's what they believe. That's what they believe. Because the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. But notice the rest of it because a text that is out of context is a pretext. And the Bible says in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise. With a great noise. And the elements will melt with fervent heat. Jesus' return will be a surprise, but it won't be a secret. You see, when Jesus talks about coming as a thief, 
He's referring to coming at a time when you will least expect it. Jesus is saying, get ready, get prepared, be on guard, because I'm coming unexpectedly. Each one of us here tonight has to make a decision for ourselves to be ready, because you don't know when the thief is coming. You don't know when the thief is coming. You ever experienced thief before? Yeah, someone told me about it just the other day. So Tomlinson told me a story about thief. Told me a story about thief. <laughs> Brother Tomlinson tells me about thief every day. According to Brother Tomlinson, pure thief in London. Pure thief. Pickpocket thief. Woman thief. Male thief. Young thief. Old thief. Everyone thief. But it's true. Pure thief. Cyber thief. Yeah, internet thief. Yeah. All kinds of thief. Identity thief. Listen to me. You see, the thief does not call you up and say, Sister Tomlinson, Sister Tomlinson, hi, lovely day, isn't it? Isn't it? Isn't it? Isn't it a lovely day? Sister Tomlinson, listen, I'm going to stop by your house about six Six o'clock, Sister Tomlinson. Can you please make sure you're not home? I'm going to need about 60 minutes, maybe half past the hour. Come back, Sister Tomlinson, for your evening tea. Come back at about 7.30, and everything will be finished. <laughs> the teeth doesn't do that. No such thing as a nice teeth. You have some dumb teeth. Yeah, you have some dumb teeth. Because I had my car stereo stolen twice. First time, they only took the faceplate. Can't do anything with that. It's a dumb teeth. Second time, they took the whole thing. Thief doesn't tell you when he's going to come. See, God knows us very well. He knows that if he told us he was coming at 9 o'clock, on May the 22nd, we'd be messing with sin at 8.59. So he doesn't tell us. Because he wants to see who's going to be Sardis and who's going to be ready. But it's not going to be a secret. It's not going to be a secret. It's not going to be a secret. But the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, loudest man-made instruments in the Bible, and the dead, the sardest, those who have died in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so the only question we need to ask this evening is, are you ready? Are you ready for Jesus to come? Are you faithful in all that you do? Have you fought the good fight? Have you stood for the right? Have others seen Jesus in you? God tells us, to be ready. Tells us to be ready. Tells us to be ready. It says, therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death. The Bible actually talks about a good death. It's death to the carnal nature. Buried with him in baptism and death. That just as Christ was raised from the dead, by the glory of the Father, even so, we should walk in the newness of life. The Bible says that we can be born again. We can experience the resurrection power. No matter how dead you feel, no matter what has happened to you physically, spiritually, mentally, God is able. God is able to bring you back to life. 
But you have to get ready. You have to get ready. Who believes God's word? Who believes God's word? Who wants to be ready? Who wants to be ready? He can come anytime. Anytime. He could come whenever he wants. Yet, yeah, don't worry about the prophecy chart. <coughs> don't worry about any of those things. He come when he's ready. He says, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be. When the Son of Man comes, they were eating, they were drinking, they were giving to each other in marriage. They were having a good time. They had a maid in the shade with a glass of lemonade. And then the flood came. And only eight people were saved. Jesus says, get ready. He says, don't be like Lot's wife. Don't turn back. Move forward. Move forward in your journey with Jesus Christ. Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready for Jesus to come? Sandra is going to come. And I want you to be ready. I want you to be ready. I want you to be ready. It was the beginning of November 2016. I was on my way home, making a left turn, going about 10 kilometers per hour, when out of nowhere came a speeding car and hit my SUV and destroyed my car. It was a total write-off. And I walked away from that car. I walked away from that car. And a friend of mine sent me a text message. He said, you lost your car, but you didn't lose your life. <laughs> but had it been slightly different that day, it could have easily been over in a second. I remember when I looked up and saw the car speeding towards me, there was nothing I could do. There was no running, there was no jumping, there was no getting out of the way. When it's your time, it's your time. And I was lucky, but when it's your time, it doesn't matter if it's a Monday or a Tuesday or Wednesday, you've got to be ready. And I invite you to stand here this evening. And I'm encouraging you from a few different levels here this evening. I'm encouraging you to be ready spiritually. Get yourself ready. That's the first step. Get yourself ready. It doesn't matter if you're in the far country of sin like the prodigal son. Get yourself ready. Get yourself ready. I'm encouraging you to be ready. I'm encouraging you to be alive. Come on now. Don't let your faith die. Don't let your church die. Don't let this become another religion sanctuary one day. Don't give up. Don't give up. Today I'm encouraging you because I want you to know that even if something is dead, God can bring it back to life. Or God can give you something brand new altogether. And He gave me a new life when I gave my life to Him. Didn't have the same friends, but He gave me some new friends. Didn't go to the same places, but He gave me some new places. Didn't spend my time the same way, but he gave me some new ways to spend my time. And as I sat there in the pew, listening to the preacher sing the song and preach the sermon, he asked the question, are you ready? And I had to get ready. Today I'm encouraging you to get ready. I'm encouraging you to get ready. As Sandria sings this song, if you need that resurrection power, if you need to be ready, or tonight if you need to give your life to Jesus Christ,
prepare through Bible study, through baptism, through recommitment to give your life to Jesus Christ. So whatever your need is this evening, Sandra's going to sing at the end of this song. I'm going to pray. And I invite you to join me. I invite you to join me. If you're living in Sardis, I invite you to come out and to join me for prayer this evening. As Sandra sings, are you ready for Jesus to come? <laughs>